Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 447, featuring the third and, as it turns out, final installment of my interview with Mr. Kevin Saunders. In this part of the interview, we talk about Knights of the Old Republic 2. Uh, we talk about what it was like at Obsidian uh, working with Chris Avalon, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff on KOTOR 2. Uh, we talk about game endings and how, how to handle that process, why it's so hard to get that right, and why, why so many games kind of flop towards the end. Uh, we also talk about the early days of MMOs with Shattered Galaxy, Nexus, and Kingdom of the Gods. And then uh, Kevin talks about his uh, legacy, looking back over his uh, career uh, in game development. It's very touching. I think you will get a lot out of it. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here. So without further ado, here is Mr. Kevin Saunders. So I think this brings us to Star Wars. Knights of the Old Republic 2, the Sith Lords. So I can't imagine what this must have been like. It's going to be part of something like this. I mean, I mean, for one thing, you got the whole Star Wars universe, one, probably one of the most famous franchises of all time, easily. But then mm -hmm. to be following one of the best games of all time. I mean, I, I know plenty of people. The Knights of the Old Republic 1 is their favorite game, period. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. Just people love that game. And, you know, for good reason, too. You know, so what, what was this like for you being part of this? Yeah, it, w it was very exciting. So I um, I worked, at, I was at Electronic Arts and worked on the RTS and then was started working on the Lord of the Rings RTS there. And I was let go after... Um, after we so we moved, I had started at Westwood Studios in Las Vegas, and I was there for a week. When we had a company meeting, and EA was closing us down, oh. and they moved a third to go to Redwood City area to work on Earth and Beyond. Um, so actually, I you know I first met George there, but only briefly. Um, he went for that group. Uh, then a third went to LA to work on to merge with. Westward Irvine, Westward Pacific, to work on Command and Conquer games, and then a third. Sorry, um, no, no, no work for you. And I was what the heck? brand new, so they didn't know what to do with me. So they sent me to LA because I was part of that. I was working on Command and Conquer three at the time, um, though that game stopped development and then was picked up again later. And so we merged into the other Westward Studios. So I was there for about a year, and and then I was looking for work again, and I saw a job opening on Game of for Obsidian Studios, and I liked Black Isle Studios. Now, the years when I was in college was a, a dark time for my gaming experience. I didn't own a computer, and I was busy trying to be a, a, a student. You're an engineer, um, right? Played, uh, yeah, environmental engineering. Was no computer, wow. Well, we had computer labs, oh. but I didn't have, I didn't own a computer gotcha. myself. Um, I played online chess. It was maybe my big game, <laughs> game diversion then. Uh, so I missed, uh, like, uh, there's a whole chunk of time I missed, so I didn't play the Baldur's Gates. At the time, I didn't play Planescape Torment, um, but I had a favorable feeling about their games and Black House Studios. And uh, my point of contact was Chris Avalone, who was the creative director there, and he was the lead designer for Knights of the Old Republic 2. And one thing he that he impressed me with is so during the interview process, like every week, he would send me an email update even if it was just, I have no new information for you. And that was very considerate and helpful as a job seeker. And so I've made a practice since then to always do that. Like on Friday, like let them know, I haven't forgotten about you, just don't have any news yet. And I'd done a design test and so I was offered a position as a senior designer working for Chris. So this was in April of, that would be 2004 and we were shipping in 
October, I think. Wow. And so I came in wow. as an area designer. There was another experienced designer, Dave Maldonado, uh, who had departed and he had written up a design and for a planet. And so that was what I started on was, um, was area design. About a month in, um, we decided that the management of the project decided we needed to cut some content to make the shipping goals, and my planet was cut. Oh. <laughs> which was oh. which was which was which was, which was fine because um, I mean that's just the way you know that's just the way things go. It wasn't because it was bad. It was just like overall like not as far along as some. As some others are not essential to the story, and and um, well, and it led to the great community effort to recreate that content. And so they, the planet that I was working on was was made by the community. Um, oh, that's sweet. So that's so that because because all the art was still there, like most, much of the art was done and was still in the product, just not active. And so people found this. They're like, what's all this? Um, uh, another thing that happened, so later working on it, so I shifted over more to systems design work. I was in charge of all the items and the lightsaber crafting and uh, um, to a lesser extent some of the mini games and uh, worked on all of that. And then lightsaber as is, that's that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was very cool. We, you know, the different I mean, that's just, it must be things. awesome to tell people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> lightsaber crafting. That was me. <laughs> and and this this will get mixed reviews from people, I think. But I was I was also in charge of the balancing for the game, and I did a, an auto balancing system. Uh, I didn't think it would be realistic to hand balance everything. And so I, I designed a system and implemented some of it, and also with, with the loot also. Uh, and so there are different levers to, to pull to adjust things. And then some of the main fights were, were custom crafted, uh, mostly by others. And, but we had such a short time frame, I feel like this was the, this was the approach that we had to take. Uh, then towards the end, we still had a problem with with the timeline. I think this has been talked about by by Fergus and and Chris at times as well. And there was um, a character Goto, or Go, yeah, or Go G O G zero T zero, who was a droid, and you went up to a ship at one point, and we didn't have any content for it. And Chris came to me and said, so we're probably going to have to cut it, but I don't want to because of the story stuff that has to happen there. Um, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, I think for the week I can repurpose some of the content I had done for the other planet. And like, it won't be a great area, but I think we can, like, we can do it. And so, so assembled that within a week. Um, the, we didn't get a complete QA playthrough. Like they, they were able to play through every section of the game, but we didn't get a complete start to finish playthrough until it was like within a week of when we submitted our gold master. Like that was it was very it was very close. There was an alternate universe where we didn't get it all together in time. But um, <laughs> so so it was it was very exhilarating and exciting. Um, and a lot of hard work over a short period of time, but we were we were definitely proud of it and happy. I mean, the The ending was thinner than Chris would have liked, um, but but overall, especially in the circumstances, um, that was a it was a it was a great game to work on. It was great, and I really liked. Chris's management style and, and approach and philosophy, and that made a strong impression on me. Hmm. I imagine endings. I was just thinking that may be the most challenging thing to get right in a, in a game, right? I just you think about all the high-profile disasters, you know, not <laughs> not not with the Codor, but <laughs> yeah, you know, certain uh, sci-fi themed titles where the fans haven't been happy with the endings of 
to say the least. But you know, I, I wonder if part of it is just you don't want it to be over to begin with, right? And what can you really do that's going to be totally satisfying? Yes. I just, it seems like the hardest thing. Yeah, I, I think another, there's a, an unfortunate, unfortunate financial reality is the fewest percentage of the players will see the ending. Mm -hmm. Like, people who play the game, like everyone's going to see, who tries the game is going to see the first hour or 10 yeah, minutes anyway. True. But only, you know, I think maybe less than half make it to the ending, even really good games. And so when push comes to shove, the ending, unfortunately, maybe the areas close to the ending would suffer first because we want to have a good ending too. Um, so it's not that they put a lot of things in game development. It's not a compromise you want to make, but, but when you have to, sometimes you have to make drastic decisions. And so what suffers and, and then the, the ending can be, can yeah, be what suffers. That's interesting. So I guess it is when you're making games, you you always wait till the end to do the ending. And I think Often, with the movies, they they could do it in any order they want, right? Right. Often, because also you're you're getting better at making the content over time. So we would generally not do the first area first because we know the first area we do is going to be bad, relatively speaking, <laughs> and we're going to have to redo it. And, but maybe we don't have enough time to redo it or to redo it properly. And so you kind of want to do something sort of in the middle where you can make adjustments around it. Because if you do the beginning first and you mess it up, then like then you have to redo it. You don't have options. And so later in development, now you've figured out more how everything works and what's most fun in the gameplay and and so you're in a better position to do the most important parts, like the beginning and the ending. It's almost like when you start off, you have so little knowledge and so much time. And by the end, you have all this knowledge, but you never have enough time to make the ending right. Yes. That just must be agonizing. And when that, and that, was, that was the challenge with Kotor 2, is really their, their, the ending wasn't as finished as it could have been. It's not that the ending was bad. It's right. that it was it was not everything it didn't include everything that we wanted it to include we just sort of ran we ran out of time and had to have it at least complete um so <laughs> you had to stick to be continued there <laughs> right <laughs> to be continued well so you might have to fill in some gaps here for me so what came between Coder Two and Shattered Galaxy. It's a few years. So that ago. was the that was my year at Electronic Arts, and then also actually, um, I don't widely advertise this, but so after I, so Shattered Galaxy was not commercially successful. So Nexon wanted to make a game for the U.S., and Shattered Galaxy was that game, and. It not making a lot of money led Nexon to decide we're not going to try to make new games in the U.S. At least for now, we're gonna we're making lots of money in Asia. We're gonna keep doing that and we'll localize them in the U.S. And I had a team, including myself, a direct team of four people, and I was asked to lay off half of us. Oh. And I decided that I should be one of the ones to go. So I. I some some of the newer people the the, the, the two people who stayed um, were newer and had the most energy, and maybe they would find some more things to do with the product, uh, and also the experience was more valuable for them, um, and and so it just felt it felt like the right thing to do. So I was then unemployed and I had a harder time finding another job than I expected. I went and stayed with my brother's family in Virginia for a while and I I ended up getting a job with Crytek working on the first Far Cry. Oh. And so I went to Coburg, Germany. A great game. It, it ended up being a great game. Well, let's back up a little bit, try to get at the start, and see if we can scoot back to the start of the Shattered Galaxy story. 
Uh, so I was reading about this game. Uh, so I got listed as 2001. And so this is what Moby Games says about it. They call it a massive multiplayer game that mixes several genres, including role-playing, turn-based strategy, real-time strategy, and tactical combat. So it's not like a, <laughs> like a smorgasbord of games. All in a persistent universe. And it's like a massive, speaking of chess, it's like a massive chess match with production against 100,000 other people. I mean, that just sounds like the definition of chaos to me. But <laughs> how would you describe this game? <laughs> so the inspiration was the success of StarCraft hmm. in Korea. So the, so Nexon's thing was massively multiplayer online games. Oh, eSports first... phenomenon. Yes, but well before that, that before that time. Um, and so Nexon's first game was um, an MMORPG, which the English name was Nexus, the Kingdom of the Winds. So this was actually launched before Ultima Online, but it was in Korea, and so we didn't hear about it much here. Yeah, so how did you hear about this and get involved? In... I was... So I was working on my master's degree in environmental engineering. My experiments, my research involved bacteria degrading volatile organic compounds in groundwater. And uh, so it was funded by the Air Force. Degrading. <laughs> it was funded by the Air Force. Oh, that sounds who had, had polluted sites with jet fuel and looking okay. for innovative ways to clean it up. Okay. And so some bacteria eat components of jet fuel. And so I was I was trying to model that system. So it would take a few days of work to set up an experiment. But then when an experiment was running, it would last two or three days. And I'd have about five minutes of work every hour to take a reading, to do some things, to, to, to get some data. Uh, but I'd have to be up for a long period of time. So I would, I, you know, I would take like two or three hour naps and miss a couple readings. Uh, but I'd be pretty much up for two or three days. And I'd sleep on the floor in the lab. Wow. So as the experiment progressed, at least uh, as an excuse to myself, I, I wasn't being productive. So I would play online games to stay awake so I could, you know, to continue the experiment. And I came across Sierra's Realm online. Oh, nice, yeah. Back then. And through that community, I heard about this one, Nexus, the King of the Winds, and started playing it. And I got really active in the community, and I posted things on the forums as players will. And it was, this was being localized from Korea for the U.S., and Nexon, the U.S. office, was three employees at this time. And I was with a buddy within the game. Because the company was so small, so the president of the company, he had an in-game character who was a god. And he would come and talk to the players sometimes about stuff. And he ended up talking with my buddy and I. And my buddy asked him if they were hiring. And he said, actually, we're looking for someone to run this game because we have a new game coming and the guy running this game needs to go to work on that one. And I followed up with him afterwards and I had made a good impression because of how I was active in the community. And so I had a job interview kind of in, in game wow. with, with God, with the president of the, of the U S company. Uh, I had your burning bush moment. Huh? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Actually, that was one thing that was really cool about the game is the god characters could affect things in the game world. Like you could change in game through that character, you could change the spawn rates of things, or you could make things appear. So during events, you would hide invisible somewhere and make things happen. Uh, and, that, and that game still exists and is played today yeah. by some. Um, and I had an interview with. A, this was so this was 98 and so the the dot-com boom was underway and I interviewed for a technical support position at um, I forget even what they did it was a technology company and it was out in San Jose 
and Nixon's U.S. office was in Sunnyvale. So while I was out there for that interview, I kind of swung by in uh, Nexon's office. And so, so I was offered this job to be the game director for this game I was playing that was just about to be launched. And I, it wasn't, yeah, financially, it wasn't a great opportunity, but I get, I get to run an online game. Like, I can't pass that up. And then I can tell my kids later I used to make games and I'll get a real job, you know, later and just, you know, do this for now, and and so uh, that's how I joined. That's how I joined Nexon, and after working on Nexus: The Kingdom of the Winds for a year, and so that that role was like, I man, we did the game director. We did everything. Like we did events in the game. We did new spells and new AIs for our opponents and new areas and customer support and technical support. Now, the population, uh, like it's not on this. You know, World of Warcraft has. You know, millions and millions of players. We're talking like a few thousand, so it was enough for a small company, um, but it wasn't it wasn't at the scale of things later. And this was so this was pre EverQuest at the time I was there, um, and after Ultima Online, uh, and things were young enough. We got to try, we got to try all kinds of things and, and I, so I implemented the crafting system within the game and then I would have data the best part was you'd have all the server data of what people did so you would do, create some event or whatnot and then you'd get to see how people used it and you could have log messages so you'd have an idea of of what things were popular you know and then customer support people would report their items stolen so you look in the logs and try to figure out like what what happened mm. and how, how to provide justice um we there were there were a number of crazy incidences that we had that were part of being like a small like such a small company in a very innovative field uh, we had a case where uh, there was a bug introduced by a new client that allowed infinite money into the game and so normally if you have a situation like that where well, you restore we restore the backups but it turns out that the server had filled up and hadn't been creating backups for like 10 days uh. and so we'd have to like set everyone back like 10 days so what, what do we do and so we so when first you, you find out about this stuff like you maybe hear whispers within the game like of there being like extra money right and so then you check like the chat logs and such and you find people talking about it, and then you find you find the source of the problem. And so this is all like detective work. And so we, what we ended up doing was we had to revert people to the money they had back in that time, and we made an event and we called it the reckoning, and we gave everyone <laughs> some amount of it was subscription based back then, and so we gave everyone some amount of free time as acknowledgement. Um, another another crazy story was. We were having um, denial of service attacks that were taking the server. The, well, the server was crashing, like for like ten minute periods, no one could connect, and we tracked it down to the cause was a couple players in the game were doing this to get to, to cause players to die so they could steal their stuff. They were intentionally causing lag in the game. Jeez, what and is up so, with those people? And so we had a technical solution to it, but it would take, it was going to be like a month or so before we could do it. And so in the meantime, we tried to do subtle things to placate these people to discourage the behavior without letting them know that we knew what was going on. Um, and we also talked at the time, I, I ended up talking to the Secret Service people who were involved in like anti-hacking efforts. Like we found that these people were um, like from from Russia and why were they uh, so interested in recognizing they, they wanted to get more stuff for their characters they wanted to get more in-game rewards so they would they would, the way that system worked if someone's when someone died they left their items there but they were protected for a certain period of time so the idea was you'd have this tension of having to go back to get your stuff and yeah, so I remember those. I remember these attacks, like yeah yeah <laughs> muds so we did things like we 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 changed those penalties somewhat to stop 
because the bigger problem from our end is that no one can play the game for a certain period of time. But it was amazing to find that it was because these people were like greedy in the game. <laughs> I got the Secret Service involved. That's cool. Yes, that was interesting. Interesting meeting. So anyway, that was sorry. That was a big tangent. So then, um, Shadow Galaxy. So I was asked to be the lead designer for Shadow Galaxy. the The concept was from Sangwon Chung, who was a server programmer, who was also a very powerful creative component and personality within Nexon. He's a really nice, sincere, brilliant guy, and um, he he had this vision for basically massively multiplayer StarCraft. And so that was the idea. And what we ended up with, uh, so you wouldn't build any buildings. You had a squad that ranged, I believe, from 6 to 12 units. Uh, but then we would have battles that could include up to four sides of 30 players per side. So you could have these, these massive tactical combats. And the strategic element was there was a world map and the battles would be over territory in the map and your side would get benefits from how many territories you owned. And the battles themselves would last 30, up to 30 minutes. And there were points of contention within the map. You had to have your units, ground units on them for a certain period of time to take control of it. And if you control all of them, your side would win. And people could dynamically enter the battle. So on the strategic map, you'd see these fights going on and you would go to join them. And this is where that downtime would occur. So if your side was being successful, and this is part of the inherent balancing of it, then your territories would extend far from your capital. And so your character would have to walk to the fight. And so there'd be time where you're in transit to get to the fight. So if a, if a side is losing, then an advantage they have is very short supply lines so they can get reinforcements to the battles quickly. So you would have people coming, like, re like joining fights midstream. So like, hey, we're losing over here, send some reinforcements and other people would come and, and join. And we need these kind of troops to send, you know, because this is a weakness that, you know, against the, what the enemy has. Um, Sounds like a lot of fun. It was, a, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and it was a very interesting concept. We, the, the player base never, like it, I think it was a little, part was a little too complicated. Part was like our, our graphics, this was 2001 when we came out and our graphics were unfavorably compared to StarCrafts from 98. Um, and so I, th I think we had some trouble getting, getting traction. Now, one strange phenomenon is we were very popular in Singapore for some reason. About 40% of our players were from Singapore. Huh. And so we had two peaks. We had like like kind of a U.S. peak in player use, and then another peak when it was evening in, in Singapore. Um, I don't know why that that was the case. And we were in a long, we had a very long beta period where we were open to the players, and we got to experiment a lot with the gameplay before we launched. I think another thing that didn't help us is. Um, we launched uh, about two weeks before 9-11. Hmm. Um, and so two, and weeks, after, two weeks before that? Roughly, oh, yeah. Wow. Right, right after we came out. But we, we, um, we won four of the six awards at the Independent Game Festival earlier in the year. And we got some other recognition. GameSpot listed us as the best multiplayer game of that year. Uh, but it didn't it didn't translate into into dollars very well. And so with that type of game too, you need a certain amount of population for it to be fun. And and we were we were like just barely had had enough. We had to consolidate the planet somewhat to to keep the activity high enough. Yeah, I was having some fun on the forums a while ago before this interview. I was looking at what people were were saying on them. <laughs> I guess there's this massive uptick in 2017. A lot of I people hadn't coming heard about that. Yeah, a bunch of people great. coming back to the game, but it's kind of, I don't know if it's funny, maybe more sad. There's a couple people that posted after this, like recent, more recently than that, within the, I want to say within maybe the last couple of months, and they're like, oh, it looks like I missed the, 
2017. <laughs> 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 yeah, a couple of years. I mean, you probably check in there from time to time, right? Just out of nostalgia. I have I have a little bit, and there's some there's been some interest in uh, Shadow Galaxy two. In fact, when I read the so when I founded the studio Nebula for Nexon, it was something we talked about that being our our project. But kind of the the timing didn't seem right within the company. But it, it seems there's definitely some interest still. So Sang Won Chung, he is the one who hired me there, and he leads their game development, and which is again the company's thousands of people now. When I joined Nexon, I was the fourth employee at the U.S. office. And there were about 40 people in Korea. So it's grown 100 times since then. Um, and so there's some interest at the at the top in the Shadow Galaxy 2. So maybe someday, if the timing seems right, it'll, it'll happen. You ever play Mega, Mega Wars? I haven't. Tell me. I was just thinking about that. Uh, I had a guy on David Beatty. He's a friend of mine. And I'm not sure what the... I don't have any notes prepared on this. I'm just thinking, <laughs> trying to use yeah, this memory. Uh, but it was a big sort of uh, online multiplayer. The reason I'm thinking about it is in the Shatter Galaxy had this reincarnation concept. Mm. So I think the idea behind that was, right, you'd come, you could complete it and then come back with a level one, which kind of start over, but you have some perks. And it's, yes. So they had this thing where there'd be, there'd be these wars so after that was over, it basically could start back. So it was great for people that hadn't been playing all all along because they could sort of get in without having to worry about players that had all this incredible you know, experience yes. and resources. So it sounded like a neat... It'd be fun to get you to talk to him. <laughs> well, that, so that, that's that, that's one the, of the recurring problems with these multi, online how universes. Concept, yeah, how that concept came up was... So during the beta test... There were times where we would have to make massive changes, and so we'd have to reset all the characters. Like everyone, sorry, we're in a beta. Like you're all level one again. <laughs> Yay! <did> yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. We did it two or three times, and when we did it, we saw a huge increase in the number of players right afterwards, and it would stick. It was like, oh, why well, you think it'd be the opposite? I, yeah, that's what I would have expected too. But I, I have to imagine what happened was there were people who were interested in the game, but oh, I'm too far behind now. But now, if I come back, I get a fresh start, and so it's a good time. I'm reminded about the game, and I can get in fresh again. And this happened on multiple occasions, and so it occurred to me, well, let's just make this part of the game, and let's increase the. This is part of the increasing the rate of advancement, and then every few months we have this reincarnation. And and we'll give everyone long term minor bonuses so that we don't mess up our power curve. But now everyone gets to start fresh again. If you've been away from the game for a while, you're not going to be that far behind other people. Um, but that was that whole the whole idea came out of this ob this this counterintuitive observation during the beta test that wiping the characters made people happy. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's that same reason with. Why I see with the world of uh, world, world of Warcraft, why people that have not played in a while will come back when there's an expansion mm -hmm. you know, or something that's going to level the playing field. And I know that feeling too, because I wouldn't want to just I wouldn't want to start playing WoW right now. You know, yeah. I have to deal with people that have you know they've been basically doing nothing else all this time and <laughs> build up their well, character. And that's true. And I think I mean that's true for a game like WoW, but it was especially. I mean, our game was all about player versus player. Hmm. We had oh. some really dumb aliens that you could do, you could fight combat with, but it was not good. Like you didn't play it for the player versus environment. There wasn't anything there. Um, and so, being player versus player, there was a, a challenge all along. Was how do we make? Like, you need to. You want to feel that you're advancing, but yet yeah, we need to not have everyone else be crushed well just to wrap up here uh thanks again for taking this time well thank you chat with us really appreciate this it's kind of a big question big talk about scope but you know looking back over two decades in the games industry and a lot of different hats a lot of different roles 
And what words would you use to describe your career and the relationships you formed as part of the games industry? Hmm. I I definitely I, I love a lot of the people that I've met through working in games. One of the things that has kept me in games is the passion that people have for their work. The fact that we're there because we all want to be there. Mm -hmm. For a few years after Obsidian, I worked at a serious games company, um, which was also very interesting. And there were great people there too as well, but there wasn't the same level of passion. And I found I missed that. Like when I'm managing people in games, it's very rare that the problem is someone isn't working hard enough or that like you don't have to like micromanage people and sort of make sure they're doing their job. People overall want to be there and want and, and work more than you ask them to because they get excited about something. And so it's, it's very enjoyable to work with people who have that kind of motivation. And at my, so at my current job at Embody, the, the company has a very intriguing and filling vision. And so that also creates that, that type of environment where people are working not because they have to clock in to get a paycheck. I mean, obviously they, they need money, but it's not just a job, it's, it's, a, it's a passion um, for most people. And so I've, I feel I've met a lot of high quality people through my time in games. And I, I like that part a lot. Um, I think overall, if I had to do things again, I think I would have done something else with my life though. I have, and part of what led me to serious games was a craving into my current job is, is, is a craving to provide more to society, to, to, to have a, a more powerful impact. And now, I've been fortunate in that my career in games, I've, for the most part, been able to work on games that, uh, that are a little more, I'm not sure what the right word is, but um, it's not just a just a, a mindless hack and slash experience. Meaning, meaningful is the word it comes. It's to. a meaningful, ex yeah. Like there's there's philosophical questions being raised. There's interesting strategies to figure out. There's uh, they, they go they, they have strive to go beyond just entertainment and, and to create a more an experience for people that can can have some sort of impact on them. And so I'm glad, like, uh, video games is a very volatile career, at least I have found it to be. And I feel lucky that I haven't, I haven't had to work on a game that I didn't believe in, at least to, for the most part. I've been able to work on games that I, that, that were consistent with my values and things I wanted to do. Um, but I, I do have to wonder, like if I had been, if I had stayed in environmental engineering, for example, um, maybe I could have done more for the world than, than make games. But they were, games have been a passion of mine since I was a kid and it was too tempting an, an opportunity. And then it became my career and there were, some points where I considered doing something different, but but it didn't seem practical. And I still, and I'd like working on games. It never, it never, each job, nothing's, nothing's perfect. Um, there's always things that you like and dislike, but in at every job I've had, more often than not, I was excited to go to work. And I was excited to to, to um, work on the project and work with the people and help help the people on my teams to to get the most out of their passion and to get see them be excited 
And that's all been very, it's all been very rewarding. And I think hard to get in, in many types of jobs. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't regret it from that perspective, but I do, I do wonder what I might've done if my focus were on, on something other than entertainment. And I guess I'm, I, I think about that. Um, I guess I, re I reflect about that more, more these days. Um, and for uh, part of why the timing, uh, like I, I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you coming up now. I've been, I mean, I've been um, uh, a passive fan of your show for a long time. I've, I've only watched it sometimes, but I've been very happy to see it there. Like to be, to say, oh, good, there's a new Matt chat about, you know, with, with this with this person. I'm glad, like, I wouldn't always beat the time to watch it, but I, I was happy it was occurring. Um, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk with you now because I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not as articulate as I might be, but, but, but still, um, still reasonably good, uh, good shape. And uh, I want to be honest, part of this was, I want, I want my children to be able to have this kind of conversation with me. Mm -hmm. And they're old enough too. Um, but they won't, I won't let them see this for, for a while, but um, sometime in the future. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to, to chat with you about uh, some of what I've done. It's a be beautiful thought. You know, I was, I was kind of reminded of something uh, Chris Taylor said when I interviewed him mm -hmm. during a rather dark cloud in his life. But, you know, we were talking about the sort of similar territory with games. And, you know, he says, well, the important thing to remember is we're just making games here. <laughs> this, this is line, something like this. But, you know, I kind of, like, I don't know about that. You know, I think about the the role that games play in my life. You know, it's a big deal. It's not just entertainment. <laughs> I don't think I would be the person I am without, you know, games it's like true. Mask of the Betrayer, for example. It's a good or you know plenty of a uh, plenty i've had the great honor to talk to plenty of people like you that have made a big difference and i really yes. appreciate that I, I, i'm how did you how did you start what what led you to make up that chat oh uh, to make Matt chat yeah oh well i started with uh i guess the online forums writing about games and things i was playing there was some podcast they didn't call them podcast back then but you know i'd comment it's one of those guys that was always had the, had the opinion but i was writing some i wrote a book about role-playing games dungeons and desktops and then from there i thought wouldn't it be cool you know since one of the problems i ran into writing the book about these games was it's such a visual it's such a visual medium and it's kind of hard sometimes to just talk about it in words, even with screenshots to get across the ideas I wanted to, like, you know, here's the crafting system, you know, for example, and be able to describe that in words, screenshots, mm -hmm. just doesn't convey the same thing as if I could show it in a video and you know, show how it works. And so yeah. that was kind of the impetus behind that. And, you know, kind of, you know, to be honest, as a way to promote the book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wasn't even going to do uh, interviews with people. And it was, uh, I think I was doing, what was that, Sword of Fargal? Yes, I remember that game. Yes, yeah, I was doing that, and for some reason, I don't remember why, but I thought maybe I just would see if I could get in touch with the designer of this. You know, just bounce a few questions off, and you know, it turns out he's like, well, why don't we go a step further? I think it was his idea, actually. He's like, why don't we go a step further and just have a, do like a Skype interview? And you could record it and show it. <laughs> like, that's a pretty cool idea. I think I'll try that, you know. That's... Yeah, it just kind of took off from there. But, yeah, it's been really rewarding for me because I, you know, a lot of the, especially back then, a lot of the people I had on were like, this is the first time I've ever been interviewed. Right. You know, it's the first time anybody's shown any interest 
you know, bother. I mean, I guess they get email, fan mails and things, but nothing like, uh, tell me about your history and tell your stories and this stuff. So they're like, just kind of honored that they're on my show. And I'm like, no, no, it's completely the opposite. I'm like, <laughs> I'm honored to be talking to you, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's been great. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I hope things go well for you. Thank you. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you uh, guys enjoyed that. I don't know about you, but that uh, this was a very emotional uh, experience for me. I don't know how well that came across uh, <laughs> uh, in the interview, but you know, it's it's even doing the editing on that was kind of a little bit tough. You know, I certainly uh, wish uh, Kevin the best. You know, as I'm sure you do as well. I'm uh, keeping in touch with him. Uh, hopefully, he will get better. Uh, that's, that's my hope, as I'm sure it is uh, for you. But <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I'm really thankful, grateful to him. You know, it's amazing. It's very humbling uh, that he would choose the uh, you know Matt Chat to come on and, and tell the story and, and all that. So <laughs> I probably don't need to uh, explain all that to you, but. Uh, just uh, thank you for that, uh, Kevin. And of course, uh, thank you uh, very, very, very much for your support of this show, for keeping uh, interviews like this coming, uh, for helping me to archive all this stuff, make Matt Chat. You know, it's been over 10 years now. Uh, I do have some pretty big news uh, about that. Uh, you, as you probably know, if you've been watching the show for any length of time, uh, I use Patreon primarily as the way to fund the show. Uh, and usually the way that works, the way it's worked until now, is a per creation basis. And so basically every time I make a Matt Chat episode, uh, everybody who's a patron gets, um, you know, charged for that episode, basically. I usually do uh, three episodes, sometimes four episodes a month if I'm lucky. Uh, but anyway, I got, I was, I've been getting a lot of, uh, actually for a long time, getting feedback about how I need to switch from that model to a month, just make it a monthly thing. Uh, so people don't have to worry about, you know, is it going to be two episodes? Is it going to be four episodes? And kind of made it tough to uh, do a good budget, you know, for folks. And especially in these times, people don't want any kind of uncertainty with their, their money. Uh, so for those reasons, I decided to uh, switch it over to the monthly setup. You know, everybody seems it's, it's going to be fine. You know, it's a good system. It's probably better. Uh, the only problem is it did not automatically uh, compute the difference. Uh, so for the folks that were like at a dollar an episode, now it's like a dollar a month, uh, which is basically a quarter an episode. So just mentioning that, you know, I know everybody's uh, probably going through some tough uh, financial times. And if you are, <laughs> you know, Matt Chats should be the least thing on your mind. Uh, but, you know, if you're doing OK, uh, please head over that to that uh, Patreon site. Uh, just take a look at the tiers, uh, see how that's changed. You know, if you can go, uh, you know, if, you, if, it's your, if you're set at a buck and you, you know it should be four or five bucks, you know, go ahead and make that change. Uh, but it will be on a monthly basis now, so you don't have to worry about these uh, these episodes. You know, I could do 10 episodes now, and you won't get charged more or anything like that. So hopefully that will uh, put to rest all the confusion around the monthly limits. You know, stuff I don't need to get into, other than I think this is simpler and better, and I probably should have done it a long time ago. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, but I finally got around to that, but I do need your help on uh, setting that up. Uh, but anyway, thank you very, very much for uh, supporting the Matt Chat in any uh, means. Uh, also, special thank you to all the folks uh, tweeting, retweeting. I don't uh, mention these folks enough, I think. Uh, but it makes such a huge difference when I tweet about a new episode, post about it on Facebook. And there's like uh, maybe a good seven or eight people that are pretty good about retweeting those. And I mean, just with that, with that uh, small number, that makes a big difference. But... You know, man, if more people would see that and just retweet it, <laughs> you know, it would really take care of this problem, uh, alleged problem we have with the uh, the small audience. I don't really mind a smaller audience, to be honest with you. But, you know, I'm always getting these comments about, you know, Matt Chat should have way more subscribers and blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, you know, uh, by the time it takes to post a comment like that, you could just have retweeted uh, several episodes and, you know, we'd be well on our way. Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm not saying you have to go do that, but I just want to say thank you to the folks who do. I appreciate your help. Whew, okay. <laughs> uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave?
I got a few uh, items here I think you'll find interesting. Uh, one is about the Apple II. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, I did not have an Apple II except at school. Uh, when I was growing up, we had a Commodore VIC-20, and then we had a Commodore 64, and after that, <laughs> the, the Amiga computers, uh, I just kind of skipped over this Apple II thing. And you know, if you watch my interviews with John Romero, uh, Becky Berger, you know, there's a hundred of them, uh, they all talk about how great it was to program on the Apple II and how they learned a basic on it, and then went from there to all the, you know, assembly and all this advanced stuff. Uh, so, you know, I often feel like I kind of missed out. Uh, well, thanks to uh, Ben J. Edwards, uh, he has pointed me to this, or rather, uh, <laughs> he didn't personally point me uh, to this, but I read his article. Uh, this is on HowToGeek.com, How to Write an Apple II Basic Program in Your Web Browser. Uh, so how cool is that? You don't have to have an emulator, nothing like that. You just go to this link, and he will explain to you how to uh, make a program in BASIC. Well, my Discord's blowing up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way, I have Discord now. Uh, so as part of my sort of revamping of Matt Chat, I made a Discord channel or server, whatever they call that, and I haven't quite figured out how to limit the notifications yet, so I'm like, doo, 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 you know, this Discord stuff, it's been fun, but <laughs> yeah, I gotta find a way to, like, uh, you know, not have it buzzing me all the time. Uh, anyway, on to this Apple II thing. Uh, Apple II emulator called Apple II JS, created by Will Scullin. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff to unpack here, but if you're really interested in the Apple IIs, or if you're like me and you kind of missed out on this, it'd be a good chance to, to uh, delve into it. Uh, second bit of news, um, and there's a game called Dwarf Explorer Regions of Ruin, and that game is actually free right now, but for a limited time. But it's, the cool thing is it's not just the game itself, but all of the DLC as well. Now, Mr. Jonathan Bolding of the PC Gamer writes about this, the developer of Vox Games has made it available limited numbers, though. So apparently it's limited numbers, I guess not a limited time. Uh, anyway, this is a side-scrolling craft-and-build RPG genre. They compare it to uh, Terraria, Starbound, you know, so that's probably enough to get to pique your interest, at least. But uh, the fact that it's got dwarves, you know, ought to be the clincher. Uh, so the open world in the story is actually handcrafted. It's not randomly generated, procedurally generated, whatever. Uh, so you're journeying around recruiting new dwarves and sending them to join a central settlement that you're building to make that sprawling dwarf fortress. So anyway, I think this is really cool. Uh, I don't know how, you know, if you do uh, have some time on your hands, <laughs> uh, this sounds amazing to me. And it's free, you know, so wow. So definitely check that out. It's called uh, uh, Dwarf Explorer RPG Regions of Ruin. Uh, and then last bit of news, if you're looking for something to watch after your... Uh, uh, favorite YouTube uh, channel, uh, YouTube, YouTuber is done with this episode. Go to the twitch.tv site. I'll post a link to this. Is You're really going to want to watch this. Josh Sawyer. Uh, so he's not even uh, being interviewed. He's just doing his own thing now. Uh, he's got an episode up on uh, Twitch TV called Reputation Overload, Evolution of RPG Reputation Mechanics. Uh, so it's a little bit of an over an hour. It's kind of like a PowerPoint Thing, uh, discussion is really in depth. <laughs> I haven't had time to watch the whole thing myself. As you know, I wanted to make this video, uh, but it was, I was kind of torn. Like maybe I should just sit and watch uh, Josh instead. Uh, but definitely go check this out. I mean, he's covering everything from Baldur's Gate to Fallout to Deadfire. I mean, it looks like it's going to be the uh, sort of comprehensive video. You know, the video on reputation mechanics. Uh, so that's really really awesome. And he's just uh, it was live, but then he's archived it so everybody can watch that for free. So definitely check that out. All right, uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. You know, and uh, again, I know we're kind of, a lot of us are going through kind of scary, unpredictable times at least. I think we can, we can all agree on that. We don't really know uh, what's going on sometimes. And one of the philosophers I like to turn to in times like that is uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so you might know him from the film uh, Gladiator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, he's got a great book. I, I'm pretty sure it's translated to something like The Meditations of, Me of Marcus Aurelius. I'm pretty sure that's the title. Uh, anyway, I'm sure you could find that and read it. I recommend it. It's, it's a really good uh, book. It's not like weird abstract philosophy. It's just more or less uh, uh, life lessons. Uh, but anyway, the quote uh, for today goes something like this. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this. And you will find strength. 
So ponder on that and see you guys next time.